And before I start, I want to thank you all for your prayers. I really felt them as I tried to put this lesson together. And um, I felt your prayers and Holy Spirit's guidance. And I'm always overwhelmed to start preparing the lesson, which means I procrastinate until <laughs> the very end when I just know I have to put it together. But I also want to welcome some, we've got some guests here today. And, uh, some of y'all that um, braved the wind and the cold this morning, so I'm glad you're here. And I hope this study that we do learn to appreciate how important angels are in our lives and, and not ignore the fact that God provides them for us. I want to thank Anne for graciously and enthusiastically agreeing to help with this quarter. I was really at a loss on how to divide up this material. But being the educator that she is, she did in a few days what I had struggled for months to do. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Anne. And as usual, I have a disclaimer that most of the material, besides the scriptures, obviously, were taken from authors who have better insights and can articulate those truths better than I can ever do. But I also want to warn you that as I was reading this lesson out loud last night, Every time I said beans, B-E-I-N-G-S, it comes out beans, B-E-A-N-S. <laughs> so, I that, just know I'm not talking about the food group. But. Uh, another thing that, if y'all have questions about angels that is something specific that you would really like to see us address, whether we're able to or not through the quarter, would you email Ann or me and we'll pass it on to what your teacher is doing that particular subject. So, you know, our emails are all in the directory and the ladies class directory and the church directory. So if you think of something, just email us and we'll try to see if there's an answer out there for some of it. Um, okay, back to lesson. Angels are now hovering around us, unperceived amid the throng, wondering at the love that crowned us, glad to join the holy song. When we first started discussing doing a quarter on the topic of angels, I was worried about how to have enough material for nine lessons. But then when I started really looking at the scriptures and the books and the information from pastors that are on the internet, then I couldn't determine how to present it in only nine lessons. There is just lots of information out there, and as Rhonda and I were talking, there's still a lot of mystery to them. I mean, even the scriptures are not going to give us a definite idea of what angels do. It's still going to be just some based on faith that they're out there. Um, <clears throat> I personally had never studied angels, and I kind of skimmed over the word. You know, it was a vision in my mind, but it didn't really apply to me when I was reading, when you read a scripture that says angels. They were something that ministered to Jesus or gave messages, but it didn't really sink in that maybe they applied to me. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word malak, M-A-L-A-K, is used 108 times. And in the New Testament, the Greek word angelos is translated angel 186 times. The words can literally be translated messenger. But while it's true, these terms sometimes refer to human messengers, the terms most commonly return to the heavenly order that is above man. And I should have practiced this to make sure I was doing this right. Actually, I think I'll just do that. So what is an angel? One writer says an angel is a supernatural, celestial being <coughs> of pure spirit, superior to humans in power, goodness, beauty, intelligence, and abilities, who serves God in many cap capacities, one being a messenger, another as an intended spirit for a human or humans. Another writer offers this definition. By angels, we mean those spiritual beings which God created higher than man 
some of whom have remained obedient to God and carry out his will, and others of whom disobeyed, lost their holy condition, and oppose and hinder his work. The words Malik and Angelos are used in many ways through the scriptures. To simply interpret the word as messenger does not yield <coughs> the intended meaning, meaning always. Anyone, whether a celestial or ter terrestrial being, could be considered a messenger. Context, not definition, is the ultimate means to determine the way any word is used. A systematic study of angels is called angelology. But the only valid study is based on scripture. The Bible gives us God's perspective on the role of angels. Prior to the late 20th century, the modern world sneered at the exist existence of spirit beings. <clears throat> this principle is described this way. It seems that the philosophy of naturalism has become so widespread that many educated people do not acknowledge anything but what the eye can see and the ear can hear. Yet in lands where education is not so available, people hold various beliefs in spirit beings. Furthermore, these beliefs are not passive, but rather convictions that influences the way they live. So why do Christians believe in the experience of angels? The evidence in Holy Scripture is undeniable. The combined witness of the Scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, and the Divine Savior assure us that there is a world of intelligent, although invisible, creatures about us and above us that warrants our prayerful and careful study and challenges us to expand our categories of thought and to change our conduct in life in accordance with God's truth. In the latter part of the 20th century, there was a renewed interest in the study of angels. Billy Graham published his book, Angels, in 1975. It was an immediate bestseller and has since sold more than 5 million copies. In it, he gives credence to the existence of angels and their interactions in our lives. A quotation from his book said, Angels have a much more important place in the Bible than the devil and his demons. Therefore, I undertook a biblical study of the subject of angels. Not only has it been one of the most fascinating studies in my life, but I believe the subject is more relevant today than perhaps at any time in history. The first book I read that made me think about angels and demons and spiritual warfare was a fiction book published in 1986 by Frank Peretti called This Present Darkness. That book has also sold millions of copies. But in his foreword, he says that he envisioned a story that would convey the dangers and workings of warfare in the spiritual realm. He envisioned a movie of the mind, a fiery winged flight through dimensions never dreamed of, blade to blade encounters with the ugliness of spiritual evil, and the triumph, the blazing white light of God's holy angels slingshot to victory by the prayers of struggling saints. Ephesians 6.12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the 1990s, angels became a popular theme. Angel mania was evident in major magazines, best-selling books, and universal seminars. The popular television series, Touched by an Angel, had 211 episodes over nine seasons. Willow tree figurines were introduced in 2000 and are sold in most Christian bookstores and gift shops. <coughs> More than a million people worldwide read the bi-monthly guidepost magazine, Angels on Earth, which has stories about people who believe they've encountered angels. A survey in 2007 showed that 
Over 81% of those surveyed either probably or absolutely believed in the existence of angels. The interesting statistics show that by age, belief in angels is fairly consistent. Participants who attended weekly worship services were more likely to say they probably or absolutely believed in angels. This graphic showed that belief tapered off with college degrees and even more with post-college degrees. And I'll let you make your own conclusion about the political party graph. <laughs> and more women than men admitted to their belief in angels. Finally, the surprising graph to me was that the Jewish religion had 75% who absolutely not are probably not believing angels. <coughs> Considering how prevalent <coughs> and important angelic references were in the Old Testament, that just surprised me. A Gallup poll in 2016 had some interesting statistics about religious beliefs. It is telling to see that the 79% who believed in God is so much less than the 96% of those who were surveyed in 1944. And of course, we're encouraged by the percentage of people who believe in God, but is all of the increase in belief in angelic activity and the angel mania that is now part of our culture good or bad? As Charles Hodge said, more wrong is thought and taught on angels by far than that which is right. So it's important that a study be based on scripture and not speculation. The biggest danger may well be greater susceptibility to spirituality's dark side. Mankind's mental doorway may be open to thinking about religion and eternity, but it's probably also open wider to Satan's influence. Scripture warns us that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then that if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. And a stronger belief in angels is no guarantee of a greater understanding of God's truth. History says Islam was born when Muhammad supposedly received visions from someone he believed to be the angel Gabriel. And Mormonism was established by Joseph Smith when he envisioned an angel named Moroni, giving him the Book of Mormon. But even without a drastic, unauthentic revelation which spawned a new cult, the easy lure of preferring angels over God offers a form of spirituality devoid of Jesus and God. Life magazine attached the label God Light to the angelis angelism movement. At a conference of angel enthusiasts, the angels were described as a more benign and bite-sized species, cuddly as a lap dog, conscientious as a crossing guard. <laughs> They were just a nice, warm feeling and a feeling of love that washes all over you. In its December 27, 1993 edition, Time Magazine ran a feature that noted with journalistic objectivity that people are religion hungry, but prefer one without a personal God to answer to. Angels are the handy compromise, all fluff in the rain, kind and judgmental. They're available to everyone, like aspirin. But according to the Bible, when people actually encountered angels, they fell to their faces in fear. There were no touchy feeling, bless your heart, the actions. Only a strict reverence for what was surely a message from God. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell face down. So why should Christians study angels? 
2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is the inspired word of God, and there is only one reliable source of information about angels. We would know nothing about angels if God had not revealed their existence and activities through his word. Every mention of everything is therefore of genuine significance. What the Bible says about angels is what God wants us to know about these marvelous beings. The Bible reflects God's <clears throat> knowledge of the universe rather than man's. Therefore, in the scriptures, the angels concerning whom man and himself could know nothing, are introduced with perfect freedom. But even though the Bible has inspired messages that give us the essence of angels and their contribution to the lives of God's people, they are never the main theme of any interaction. There are no scriptures or pages of biblical information devoted to these heavenly bodies. The study of angels is like a study of heaven. We really can't understand them or comprehend them until we meet them in eternity. Number two, numerous mention demands equal time. Angels are mentioned more than 300 times in the Bible, but in the original biblical languages, angels are alluded to more than 400 times. So if everything in God's word is given for our edification and understanding of our relationship to him, then his inclusion of the activities of angels should be of value to us. They are extremely interested in us. Luke 5.10 says, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. They are interested in our salvation. Someday, we will be like them. Luke 20, 34, 36 says, Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. The Bible says we will be like angels but never that we will become angels. To study their nature is to learn more about our own destiny. Revelation 5.13 says we will be worshiping God <laughs> with them in heaven. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands, thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. <clears throat> To increase our awareness of and enhance our appreciation of what the angels do on our behalf. Hebrews 1.14 Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And we may be entertaining angels unaware. Hebrews 13.1-2 says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For in so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. The likelihood of anyone proving or disproving the possibility of entertaining angels unaware today is a continuing discussion among Bible students. But since the Bible does mention the entertaining of angels, perhaps it would help us to study angels to learn what happened when one did entertain them and wasn't aware of it and how it affected his life. 
Angels provide transit for Christians into heaven when they die. Luke 16, 22 says, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. There's anecdotal um, stories in Billy Graham's book about his, one was about his mother. And she said right before she died, she could see the presence of angels. So who's going to dispute that? I mean, we just don't know. And until I guess we can experience that, but um, it's there. Another reason to study angels is to dispel some popular myths regarding these uh, spiritual creatures. First Timothy 4, 7 says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Myth number one that needs to be dispelled is that nothing can be known. Kendall's brother-in-law, Ortiz Copeland, and his co-teacher, Harry Surratt, taught a quarter of lessons about angels at White Station Church in Memphis several years ago. And I nagged him and nagged him to send me his information. Uh, part of their first introductory lesson was that neither had ever done a study on angels. They were kind enough to send me their outline and all the scriptures they used. 39 pages. <laughs> but I have to say that the print was really big. Even I it, so it probably wasn't quite 39 pages worth. But when I printed it out, that's what it was. But since the early 1990s, the amount of published books regarding them were astounding. <laughs> some are just anecdotal. Some are not biblical at all. But there are some that are scriptural throughout. The one that I used is a study of angels by Edward Myers, who is a professor of Bible and Christian doctrine and director of Harding School of Biblical Studies at Harding University. That was hard to tell. Another book is Angels by Charles Hodge. It was an ACU and Harding graduate who preached in Churches of Christ for more than 60 years. Another resource is a book by Dr. David Jeremiah, Angels, Who They Are and How They Help and What the Bible Reveals. And um, found that one to be very scriptural, too. He kept everything he did, said, he referred back to scripture. And Peter and Carol had a book in their library by Dennis J. Caldwell, Jr., another Harding graduate. What the Bible says about the heavenly messengers, the angels. But this book is 475 pages of small print. <laughs> so obviously, he has much information in that, too. And each of these books had a full page of a bibliography at the back of their resources. So there is lots of, of information out there. And I'm sure it's a lot of it's duplicated because there's only so many scriptures about angels, but, you know, different perspectives, I guess. Myth number two is that angelology is an Old Testament, not a New Testament study. Although angels were prevalent in the Old Testament, the idea that angels ceased working at Golgotha is not consistent with the biblical facts. The Bible is unapologetically supernatural. A profound belief in angels is indispensable, having a hard time here, to the faith of a believer. Angels are probably involved on earth far more extensively than we think and certainly more than we can see. There is not a hint in the entire Bible that the earthly service of the angels will or has ceased at any time, certainly not before the end of time. These messengers of God cannot be eliminated, symbolized, spiritualized, or demythalized by some matter or other without losing a major part of the Bible. Myth number three, angels are women. In a study of angels by Frances Parr, she writes, mention the word angels and what do you visualize? In my mind's eye, I see a beautiful woman with long golden hair, 
a full flowing white robe and lovely shining wings that fluttered gracefully, propelling this wonder along. Her voice is soft and gentle. Other times, the picture is of a fat, pink baby with a crossbow and heart-shaped arrows <laughs> aiming at some hapless fellow who, unknown to him, is the subject of a girl's affection. But according to the Bible, both of these images are almost totally incorrect. But many people share these misleading pictures, obviously. <laughs> the only angels that are named in the Bible have the names of men, Gabriel and Michael. When angels appear to men, they are as men. Mark 16, 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But Zechariah 5, 9 does tell of seeing two women with the wind in the wings. But he was, there was also an angel there in the conversation. God uses whatever visual image he chooses that will enable the messenger to deliver his message. Angels are without bodies. Angels are without human body, but that does not mean they are without some form of body. They are, there are both terrestrial and celestial bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly part, part bodies is another. Angels are dead saints in heaven. During funerals, many suggest that the departed are now another of God's angels. The Bible says we will be like angels, never to die, but we won't become the same creature as an angel. Another myth is that angels are to be worshipped. Some religions openly worship angels as patron saints, but the Bible specifically condemns this practice. Colossians 2.18 says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into a great detail about what they have seen, and they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. And angels are without personal feelings. They have curiosity, the Bible says. 1 Peter 1, 2, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. And then we talked about their rejoicing when Sinners repent. And as we continue the series on angels, hopefully the topics we study will answer some more of the questions regarding the misconceptions about angels. The real meat of this series comes after this lesson, when the, all the scriptures are really pulled together. But next week is a video that compares the worldview with God's view of these interesting beings. And then Calvet's lesson is on the origin, form, nature, and attributes of angels, which should give us a better understanding of God's intention for his creation. What I hope to learn through this series is an awareness and a belief in the presence of angels in our lives and an appreciation of their ministrations to us. I want the fear of the unknown and misunderstanding of angels' roles to become faith in God's provisions to help us live a human life that leads us to an eternal life with him. And I really want to close with a prayer for our teachers who are pre preparing this quarter. This is not an easy series to work on, I think. So if you would pray with me. Dear God, thank you for your word and the knowledge it imparts. Please have the Holy Spirit guide each lady as she studies and presents evidence of the heavenly bodies that you have created so that we may, may better understand your angels. In Jesus' name, amen.